Welcome to today's AUKUS lecture. Before we start, I would like to say a few words about the AUKUS Alliance. The AUKUS Alliance brings together the University of Bergen, Granada, Graz, Leipzig, Lyon, Padua, and Vilnius, seven long-standing comprehensive research university with deep regional engagement in medium-sized cities. Um, and this is the sixth of a series of guest lectures, seven months, seven universities, to be offered in the framework of the Action Line 4 of ARCUS, called Multilingual and Multicultural Universities. And we represent the subline 48. These lectures focus on specific topics related to language and culture, and um, they target mainly graduate and target mainly graduate and postgraduate students, as well as early stage researchers interested in those topics. So now it's my pleasure to give the floor or the screen to Guadalupe Soriano uh, from the University of Granada. She will introduce the speaker of today. Thank you, Jose. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce you to today's uh, speaker, Adolfo Sánchez Cuadrado from the University of Granada. Adolfo Sánchez holds a BA in Translation and Interpreting in Spanish, English and German from the University of Granada, an MA in Foreign Language Pedagogy from the University of Delaware in the USA, and a PhD in Linguistics from the University of Granada. He is currently a lecturer in linguistics at the University of Granada, but he has previously taught at the University of Delaware, the Modern Language Center of the University of Granada, and University College London. His research, research interests lie within the fields of pedagogical translation, linguistic mediation, cross-linguistic cognitive grammar, and language teacher training. Among his publications are chapters in method method Methodological Developments in Teaching Spanish as a Second and Foreign Language, in Cognitive Linguistics and Spanish as a Foreign Language, and in uh, Discourse and Communication in the Classroom. His doctoral thesis on pedagogical translation received the thesis award by the International Association of Spanish as a Foreign Language in 2016. Uh, thank you, Adolfo, for accepting this challenge. Uh, and well, the floor, the screen is yours. Thank you again. Thank you, Wada. And hi to everyone on the other side of the screen. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to share uh, this afternoon with you talking about linguistic mediation and foreign language learning. First of all, I hope that you all are well and safe in these COVID times and, uh, and vaccinated or at least near to be vaccinated. Uh, so yeah, let's start. Um, I'm gonna be presenting for 45 minutes uh, and then there will be a Q and A uh, session uh, where I will take uh, questions both in English and Spanish. So uh, yeah, to start as a sort of uh, introduction, uh, I will be addressing these three main questions you have on screen now. Uh, I will uh, first conceptualize mediation, linguistic mediation. Then uh, I'll move on to uh, talk about the strategies and skills implied in this mode of communication. And then I will touch upon a rather complex topic related to mediation in the foreign language field, which is how to assess it. And uh, I'm aware of the fact that the audience may be a mixture of teachers, researchers, learners too. Uh, so I hope that the presentation gives some tips for both groups uh, for teaching and learning mediation. And also uh, for those of you who have some background on mediation, uh, I hope that my views on, uh, on it can complement your understanding of it. And for those of you who are new to mediation, I hope that uh, I give you a stimulating glimpse at uh, this mode of communication for you to uh, want to know more in the future. So let's start, and I would like to first contextualize a bit uh, the topic mediation, and I will do that from three different angles. Uh, first, uh, a personal, my personal context, then institutional contextualization, and then a learning contextualization. 
Uh, first, personal contextualization um, and why. I think that um, if I share with you how I ended up working and researching mediation, uh, it can give you some clues about, you know, first clues about how this mode of communication and how complex it is. Um, so I've been a teacher of Spanish as a foreign language for many years. Uh, I've always uh, uh, followed a communicative approach uh, so that my students learned the language to be able to, to use it, to communicate with it, not so much to know about the language. Um, all along the way, I've also taught pedagogical translation, that is translation for learners who don't want to become professional translators nor interpreters, but who want to improve their language skills by means of translating and interpreting. So I've been able and allowed, in a way, to use a cross-linguistic um, view on foreign language learning. And I say I'm, I've been allowed because for many years, at least in the Spanish as foreign language in immersion setting, in, Granada, in Spain, for example, uh, using other languages or the students L1 was not uh, allowed, in a way. So. Um, um, I've been able to, to explore the, those um, practices with my students and um, I'm fond of cooperative learning. I, I truly think that it is through interaction and cooperation that uh, foreign languages are best learned. Uh, I've always used this approach to learning too. And also I'm a teacher trainer and as, as a teacher trainer uh, I've always um, paid close attention to make my teacher trainees aware of their roles are mediators because teachers are mediators themselves. Uh, they mediate between knowledge, and in this case, uh, the foreign language to be learned, and the learners. And they help them construct uh, knowledge and, and, and cooperate uh, among other peers. So uh, some years, uh, a few years ago, I came across this uh, construct mediation which was like a, a match made in heaven for me, actually, because it, it combined the four dimensions that I just mentioned, uh, and many others that we will be talking about. But um, uh, it, it really combined these four um, interests that I've always had in foreign language learning. And I hope that from this introduction, you don't get the, the idea that I'm going to be too biased towards mediation. On the contrary, I hope that I can give a detailed account of, of this mode of communication and the potential that I think it has for uh, uh, foreign language learning and, and, and teaching. So moving on to the institutional context, of course, we have to look at the um, CFR, the Common European Framework of Reference, um, published by the Council of Europe back in 2001. Uh, it, this text introduced um, mediation, although not too well developed back then. Uh, but in the following years, the Council of Europe um, developed other concepts uh, in their education agenda, uh, such as plurilingual in, and intercultural education, uh, competencies for democratic culture. Uh, all this was synthesized in the foreign language arena uh, by the publication of the uh, CFR companion volume last year, 2020. Um, a document on, on which many of the ideas and concepts of mediation we'll be talking about will draw today. Um, and moving to a more localized contextualization and uh, mediation uh, from the publication uh, from the publication of the CFR on uh, was being implemented in some context. For example, Greece uh, and their uh, KPG exams, the school living exams for secondary students, uh, they were uh, implementing um, cross-linguistic mediation for many years, uh, also in Austria uh, with the plurilingual oral exams and in, in, in Germany uh, with the Sprachmittlung, uh, the mediation practices in secondary education. And in Spain uh, from 2017 in terms of curriculum and 2019 in terms of uh, accreditation exams, the EOI uh, system that stands for Escuela Oficial de Idiomas, the state-funded School, language school system in Spain, uh, they've also been implementing uh, mediation in their uh, practices. So it's been going on for, for some time now, although it's still quite new. And 
if we contextualize it uh, in a learning environment, um, you can see on the screen some uh, uh, tasks, in short, uh, in brief, that you may be encountering uh, in learning, ma learning materials, if you're, teach if you're a teacher, or in test tasks, uh, if you're a student, uh, tasks with new and different uh, contexts for language use. Uh, tasks uh, where we are asked to um, help people understand things because of the complexity of the information to be uh, accessed. Tasks where we have to find people, uh, come to an agreement or find common ground on, on, topic, on a topic because they can handle a dispute or, or a conflict. Uh, tasks where we are asked to translate for others um, or we have to help them figure out the meaning of something because they have uh, a limited domain of the language where the information is given or to recommend uh, a creative text, uh, a novel, for example, to people because, of, because they're experiencing a situation in their lives and, and we, we act as an intermediary uh, between that, that text and them, and, and also uh, to produce audiovisual uh, texts, uh, but then not only produce the audiovisual text, but also dub it in the L1, or maybe audio describe it in the L2. So all these are new practices, um, in some contexts more, um, uh, more recent than in others, uh, but they are related to mediation. But it's, it's a very picture that we have here, because we don't have we, we, we clearly have a picture of someone who is reading or listening or watching, speaking. I mean, when they're using the, the traditional skills, we can, we can have a, a clear vision of them. But um, what about when someone is mediating? We don't have a clear, a clear cut vision of, of a mediator. Um, and in a way, we could say that media, uh, the, the, media, the mediator is all those pictures combined in another one. Because mediation rely, relies on the other skills, but in, it introduces uh, some other aspects uh, about which we will be talking about. And what are these aspects? How, we, how can we uh, conceptualize this mode of communication? OK, so if we go to the literature, Mm, we may be uh, well not misled, but um, we may we may get um, a blurry image about medi mediation because we may find um, definitions of mediation uh, that equals uh, um, mediation uh, at the mediator to the role of the intermediary, uh, then mediation as as helping people understand things or um, a more um, view of mediation as information transfer uh, or uh, a more um, view of mediation uh, as a relational or a psychological tool to reduce the distance between two poles of otherness. So um, if we check the literature, we, we will find sometimes, or quite often, um, maybe a two categorical stance on the definition of mediation. Um, Many authors have defined mediation from their point of view, uh, but mm, they lack, I think, a more nuanced view of mediation because it is a very complex, uh, complex um, um, concept. And we, I think that it's not uh, the best strategy to go about defining it, um, looking at it at, for, from just one angle, but to try to combine all of them. So um, there's uh, this risk when we check um, the literature of uh, thinking that mediation is something when it is more than that. And if we look at the companion volume itself, um, the, the, the mere de definition it gives about mediation, you have it on the screen. In mediation, the user learner acts as a social agent who creates bridges and helps to construct or convey meaning, sometimes within the same language, sometimes across modalities, and sometimes from one language to another, we can also see that it's a very dense definition. That it, there's, there's a lot of information here, a lot of ways of uh, looking into mediation. Um, so we are going to try to 
uh, analyze this rather dense um, and cloudy in a way um, definition by looking at the key elements that it, it gives us. So um, we're talking about user learners. So there's a focus on language use. We want uh, the language to be used by the by the um, by our learners because they, we want them to become users of the language. Uh, then th they act. So there's a focus on, on tasks. They exert agency uh, in, in society. So there's a focus on context too. So we have a very uh, situated uh, learning experience here. We're preparing students not to uh, to be able to to act in society to do things and get things done um, by using the language then we have uh, create bridges so there's a interpersonal interpersonal and relational dimension to to um, uh, mediation here um, the kind of you know of language use we we carry out when interacting with others in, in everyday uh, life situations or uh, someone who helps uh, other, uh, others communicate. Then we have cross modalities. Sorry, then we have uh, helps to construct meaning. So the, the user helps to construct meaning. Help, it's a social constructivist view on, on language. Language is a tool to construct meaning and the mediator as someone who helps others uh, construct it and then convey meaning which is uh, more an information transfer uh, when uh, the mediator passes information on to someone or helps people uh, access information they cannot access themselves then we have uh, within the same language so we have uh, intralinguistic mediation um, in one language uh, but between two different varieties or two different registers um, or modalities, because we have across modalities here. So from a visual input to a written input or from oral to visual and written and, and a mixture of modalities at the same time too. And then we have from one language to another, which is cross-linguistic mediation. And back in the day, mediation used to be uh, confused. Uh, it was taking us uh, translation and interpreting. And mediation has this cross-linguistic side to it, but uh, it doesn't have to be cross-linguistic. So it's not only translation and uh, interpreting, it's more than that. So um, we have uh, a very dense concept here. And the companion volume uh, has given us um, uh, this scheme you know, to shed some light on what mediation is in foreign language learning and using. Uh, and they've given us a series of uh, mediation activities and strategies. And I will look, I will go through um, this um, scheme. You can find the companion volume very quickly um, so that we have in mind all the uh, mediation activities that we can start working with if we want to implement mediation. So and there are three major areas. There's mediating a text, which is more informative uh, kind of uh, mediation, where we have a list of uh, language activities focused on uh, passing on information, uh, giving people access to information, um, uh, searching um, information and sharing that information with others. Uh, in different ways, because we may be um, focusing on details or we may be wanting to summarize it or to translate it. I mean, different ways of going about mediating a text, but we are uh, mediating between an informa some information and people who have to access that information. Then we have two uh, language activities related to creative texts, not only li literary, but they can be literary too, of course. Um, a more informal um, language activity expressing personal responses to creative texts and then analysis and criticism of creative texts. Um, so here the mediator acts as a bridge between the text, the, the creative texts, uh, and explain it or um, uh, paraphrases it or you know, give some information on, on, on the text and why they like it or not, blah, 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 to someone else. Or in a more academic um, setting, we ask the mediator analyzes and criticizes the, the, the texts. Then we have a whole um, area devoted to teamwork. 
to con collaboration with others, to uh, construction and cooperation with others. Uh, it comes under the term mediating concepts and it's, uh, it's focused on uh, collaboration in a group or leading group work. So here we have the social constru constru constructivist view of mediation and, and cooperative uh, learning and use of the language. And then we have under mediating communication, uh, a language activity facilitating plurilingual space, which is uh, related to intercultural competencies of the mediator. And then two more language activities um, related to using the language as an intermediary between people who cannot communicate or because they, they, they use a different language or they don't understand each other. Um, or they cannot handle difficult situations, so they cannot understand each other in a, at a more personal level, uh, affective level in a way. And then the companion volume has given us some strategies um, implied uh, or needed uh, when carrying out these activities. Uh, it's given uh, five um, um, strategies. Um, as such, but there are many others uh, scattered all throughout the, the, the companion volume, and we have to look for them when we read the companion volume because it's not only these five strategies that we may need to, or we may employ to uh, mediate, but many others. But here we have um, strategies to explain new concepts. Uh, so when we are um, trans, uh, transfer information, we are helping people access uh, inform information or knowledge, we may need to sim explain new concepts to them. And also strategies to simplify texts because you know uh, they are uh, too dense or they're too difficult or they have information which is not uh, needed. Uh, so yeah, we have light here. I mean, um, the companion volume has, has done uh, a great job localizing and describing and giving us descriptors, scales for all these mediation activities. Uh, so we have mediation that can be informative and creative and cooperative and intercultural and social and strategic. So we have many, many facets here. It is a multifaceted uh, concept that we're dealing with here. And we teachers, uh, we are, I think, too much concerned about having a holistic view on mediation, on trying to, to get the, the, the big picture, uh, focusing on all these details and all these uh, uh, facets of such a polyhedral uh, concept. And I think that we might need to go in a different way. We might need to take a broader look at the, the picture and see how mediation interacts and intertwines with all the other aspects uh, implied in, in learning and using a foreign language. Because uh, this way, we may mm, get a, a clear picture of what mediation is, uh, and then be able to understand all these mm, different aspects implied in it. So the first uh, um, way to go about this is uh, in getting to know the agenda. Uh, the Council of Europe's uh, agenda. Because um, in the CFR, the Council of Europe uh, tried to introduce this approach, AOA, that action-oriented approach, which is close to what teachers already knew about task-based learning, scenario-based learning, um, uh, an approach um, which um, revolves around you know, the idea of the learner, and the user as a social a social agent, as I said before, who does and get the, uh, get things done using the language, um, uh, for which they need some competencies, both general, in, in the savoir in the CFR, or linguistic competencies, many different competencies, and engage in different language activities. And it also gave us these precious list of levels uh, from A1 to C2, which have become like mm, uh, uh, common uh, uh, language uh, among teachers and educators, and they've been very useful. But the, the Council of Europe, and they've, they've admitted this, have had uh, a, a, a profound impact on assessing and testing. Uh, we've come up, thanks to the CFR, with 
uh, more reliable tests and more reliable uh, teaching, um, assessing and uh, testing, pra testing practices. But with the companion volume, the CFR wants to, uh, um, to um, uh, instill this action-oriented approach uh, in a way that it reaches teaching and learning, that it really um, uh, reaches uh, the, the classrooms in Europe or beyond Europe because it's used not only in Europe, but in other countries too, and in other continents. So um, insisting on the real use of language and the plurivision of language use, plurilingual and pluricultural, with students knowing more than one, two, three, even four languages at different levels, um, and the multi-vision of language using uh, multimodal, and then uh, with, a with a focus on modes of communication instead of skills, um, the, the, com the companion volume really wants to reach teaching and learning. And it's in modes of, modes of communication that we have to, to focus if we want to um, conceptualize uh, mediation because, because mediation it is a mode of communication as stated in the companion volume. Um, and one of the best ways to understand what this is, what this implies, is um, to look uh, at uh, the relation that mediation has with the traditional skills. So um, we have listening and reading, uh, which are related to reception, the mode of communication reception. And here the focus would be in, uh, in me, the, the, the user, who um, speaks and, and, sorry, who listens and reads and receives texts, uh, understands information. And then we have speaking and writing, uh, which are the, the, the two skills implied in production. So here the focus would be in you, because I produce language for you to uh, read it or for you to uh, listen to it, as I'm doing right now, right? I'm speaking to you and you are receiving my production. Then if we add, if, if uh, to this we add nego negotiation of meaning, we have interaction, a mode of communication which was uh, separated from production uh, in the CFI in 2001 and was uh, uh, quickly uh, implemented in materials and in tests. And here the focus would be on us, of course, because it's the, the, the receiver and the producer of language who interact with each other to construct meaning. So if to all of this, we add other concepts as we've seen, such as access to information or give access to information or help, help someone access information and the co-construction of meaning and knowledge, cooperation, collaboration, comprehension, not only informative, but also uh, mutual comprehension, uh, affective comprehension, we have mediation and it, we could, you know, uh, represent this by this uh, dynamic process of me interacting with others and it. And it could be um, many things, could be texts, could be uh, culture, could be information, could be many things that interact with me and others. So we have uh, clearly a focus on uh, the social dimension of the user learner. Uh, when we talk about mediation. And, and in a way, we can picture here like a triangle, uh, a triangle of communication. So uh, if we have in, in two corners of this triangle, we have a certain information and, and a receiver, uh, the mediator will be like a facilitator that helps um, the receiver access that information. We can have uh, in one corner meaning, knowledge, and then peers, learners who uh, need to access that meaning or need to construct that meaning because it's new for them and they have to work on what they previously know about it and then constructing meaning. And then the, here the mediator would be like a co-constructor of meaning uh, who helps uh, these peers or learners access or construct meaning. And then we could have two interlocutors uh, in both uh, corners. And then uh, here the mediator would be more like an intermediary between these interlocutors, as I said before, who cannot understand each other because of some reason. So there's quite often the idea of um, an, an impediment, an obstacle that needs to be overcome. And the mediator 
helps to overcome this obstacle. Um, or at least they, they act as the third party in this triangle, the, th the third corner in this triangle of communication, um, focusing, as I said, on this social dimension of uh, language use. So uh, moving on to some examples, um, um, I'm, I'm situating my examples here, I'm locating them in higher education, adult learners of Spanish as foreign language in immersion setting, for example, learning Spanish here in Spain or in Granada, and who are mainly interested in not only, but mainly in social and academic and the use of, uh, in, uh, in the use of language in the social and academic domains. Um, why I am um, um, locating, uh, profiling my, my target students here, because mediation, as, as, you've, as you've seen, has many facets, many sides to it. So we really need to uh, pay close attention to what my students need, to what uh, prospective use of language they will do, uh, and select uh, the, the mediation, ta the tasks that imply mediation activities that are relevant for them. It's only through uh, uh, that method that we will be able to localize our, our teaching, something that we're supposed to do all the time. But with mediation, it's very, very important. So mediation can help move from communication to action. And what does, that, uh, what does this mean? I mean? The communicative approach is okay. We prepare students to use the language, to communicate with the language. But we want to move from that vision of uh, learning the language just to communicate things to a vision of learning the language to do things with the language, to have an impact on the real life and, and actions that are connected to real world, to the real world. So I, I'm, I'm going to give like a summary, a brief, brief summary of tasks, not the whole tasks as described in the, in, in the teaching materials, uh, but a summary, but just to give you uh, uh, some hints on uh, how mediation can help change, uh, can help uh, um, accomplish this move from simply, uh, simple communication to action. So instead of this activity in groups, pick up a celebrity and prepare to tell the class the most important facts about him, her, so that your classmates can guess who you're talking about, which is a communicative activity we've always done in class. People, uh, students prepare something, on, uh, 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 information on something, and they tell the other classmates for them to guess. We could have uh, this situation. The town hall wants to name the new park in the town after a celebrity, so in groups, pick up a celebrity and prepare your proposal to take part in the public uh, poll. Remember, you have to research and justify your selection. So here we'll have a context, a real life context. Then we have a product, uh, a, 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 a concrete product students have to come up with. Also a goal to take part in the public go, uh, poll. Uh, research, they need to do research and share that information they're uh, researching and then uh, they need to co-construct because they, they need to justify the selection. So here we will have these uh, mediation activities, processing texts uh, in the search of information and passing that information on to the, the, the classmates, uh, facilitating collaborative interaction with peers and collaborating to construct meaning and also the, the main strategy, but not the only one, breaking down complicated information. Second example, it's, there are four examples. Uh, from write an email to a friend of yours who is going to visit your hometown to send him her tips on what to do, which is a perfect task for students to produce, to, to practice their, their production skills. Um, and, you know, they're, they're writing to an email to a friend uh, they're obviously writing for, for the teacher, actually. Uh, and the, 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 this situation, which is in a way um, artificial, we could, instead of that situation, we could have, we could have uh, back home, you host many guests from Spain, in your country, your town or whatever. Uh, put together, the task would be put together a map with tips and practical info in Spanish, about your area for the prospective guests in order to comply with the flat sharing regulations, such as the ones they have for Airbnb. So here they will have, students will have a product, again, a real product. Uh, they will have to do research 
you know, uh, info on the tips and inf practical info about the area. They will have to translate because the information would be in their language or in other or in English, and then they will have to translate it in Spanish. Uh, a real context and an audience, prospective guests, and other, and also a purpose to comply with the flat sharing regulations and a connection to real life because they're creating something for for the real world. Here we will have uh, other language activities, relaying specific information, explaining data, translating a written text. They will, they will have to adapt language, breaking down complicated information and streamline uh, texts they may find for those guests who are staying in their homes. Uh, the third sample would be write a summary of the video we're going to watch in class for your teacher, something students will be doing for the teachers. Instead of that, take notes of the video we're going to watch in class to study its content for the exam. One of the classmates has asked you to pass him her the summary as they cannot make it to class today. So what do we have here? We have, again, a product, uh, notes to study for the exam. We have a goal and then uh, the context, why they need to take those notes. And an impediment here because the classmates uh, uh, cannot make it to class today, so they will have to produce something for them to be able to, 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 to be prepared to take the exam. And when we take notes and produce a text for the people, we do it in a different way uh, than when we do it for ourselves. So here we will have processing text, note taking, and uh, three uh, strategies to explain new concepts, including linking to previous knowledge. And the last example, prepare a presentation on one of the following cultural topics. Uh, you know, a presentation on a cultural topic, something we've been doing forever uh, in our language classrooms, and then pick up two contexts, for example, two countries, and focus on the differences and similarities that this uh, topic may have in these two different backgrounds. So from that, we, will, we could have a role play in groups of three, where A and B are flatmates, uh, C is a friend of A's from a different country, who is staying for a month, then B and C uh, don't seem to get along because uh, of these cult cultural misunderstandings. And we can give a short list of these cultural misunderstandings. A um, is aware of these differences and conducts a discussion to set up the conflict among the three, the three people. So here again, we'll have a context uh, uh, for, the, for communication to happen. Then we'll have an impediment, an obstacle again, and then uh, a product and a purpose too. And here we will be focusing on facilitating a pluricultural space, uh, acting as an intermediary, or uh, linking to previous knowledge. Uh, so, as I said, from all, all, all the aspects that we've been covering so far, we, could, mm, uh, we, we have a clear idea of how complex mediation is, but we can start extracting some fundamentals um, about how to go uh, with mediation if we want to teach or learn it. Uh, so first of all, the, the importance of needs analysis. Um, we have to conduct needs analysis. We need to select those mediation activities who are relevant for prospective use of the language among our students. We need to solely situate our learning because if, I'm, if, I, if my students are future uh, secondary foreign language teachers or holiday makers, or people who are going to spend some time working abroad, the, the, the tasks they will have to face to carry out, which imply mediation will be different. So um, uh, situation, then a connection to real life, uh, products, artifacts, actions, students uh, need to, to, to come up with. So we're moving from a vision of bringing the real world into the classroom, which is something we've been doing with a communicative approach to connecting the classroom to the real world, trying to do things in the classroom that truly have an impact on students' lives and, and their surroundings and their setting and the things that happen around them. And then the centrality of task, there's no mediation without a task. Uh, we need a task so, uh, so that we can move from a language center approach even from the communicative point of view and methodology, uh, where we mm, uh, learn the language, students learn the language aspects and skills in order to fulfill tasks to a task center approach, task based approach, which is fulfilling tasks in order to learn the language and to gain skills as a byproduct. Um, also, as we've seen in the, in the examples, we need to be very specific about context context specificity in mediating activities we need to specify what is being mediated where when why 
how and for whom if we are mediating information, among whom if we're mediating uh, communication, with whom if we are mediating knowledge or uh, co-construction of, of knowledge. We need to be clear about this uh, and also uh, to bear in mind that mediation implies many times an integration of modes of communication, competencies, activities, languages, or varieties of the language, modalities, etc. So it's a more meshy view of language use that we are facing here. So um, as you can imagine, when we have to assess this, um, the, 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 we have a, a, a hard task in hand. Uh, we, um, if we um, focus on formative assessment, that assessment that, uh, helps the students um, um, improve their language um, experience, Mediation can help move from assessment of learning to assessment for learning. Why? Because it really helps or it can uh, foster a dynamic view of a formative assessment. Um, the, um, all mediation tasks need specific rubrics. So we can help our students know and internalize what is important in these mediation activities by having them uh, construct these rubrics participate, take part in the creation of these rubrics, and then make decisions about what and when to assess and even take part in the assessment procedures. Once they've constructed these rubrics, they can conduct self-assessment or peer assessment. And of course, mediation is usually related to uh, complex tasks, which may need some phases. So we can have students evaluate and assess these different phases. So uh, we have a more uh, focus on the on the process than in the product here, uh, and the different work in progress phases of the tasks, and we can assess those different phases. And from um, an accreditation point of view, when dealing with assessment for accreditation purposes, um, the, the picture is even more complicated here. Uh, because if we go, we use a uh, unidimensional uni model, which is the, the more uh, frequently used uh, model in general language uh, testing, uh, we, can, um, we have to assess a, a very complex uh, mode of communication in a separate way. Uh, so we will have a, a part of the exam focusing on reading and another one in listening and then writing and production, blah, blah. So it's, it's very complicated to create reliable uh, parts of the exam, which only focus on mediation and, 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 it's there and are really unidimensional. So um, one way to go about this uh, is to use evidence-centered design, uh, which um, taps into different KSAs, knowledge, skills and attitudes uh, that, need, that are needed to, uh, in, to carry out tasks, mediation tasks, and then uh, it helps us select and prioritize and validate these KSAs in the output of students. Then uh, th this uh, design uh, aims uh, to, produ to, to, to produce tasks, uh, tasks, shells, types in a way that we can replicate but are different from one another and, and are trialed by means of focus groups and think alouts and interviews, etc., and then helps uh, construct reliable uh, instruments uh, such as rubrics with, a, with an appropriate weighting, uh, weighting of mediation traits, which will focus mainly on task fulfillment and linguistics aspects elicited by a task. Um, in this way, I, I suggest checking the, the work we're conducting at the Modern Language Center at the University of Granada, where we have uh, two uh, accreditation exams, an English uh, B1, B2 exam, Septacles, and a B2, B1, B2 uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish exam, ELADE too. And we are applying this evidence-centered design to uh, design our tasks and come up with uh, instruments for, for assessment. And the other way to go about this is using an integrated model of assessment, uh, which is based on tasks, scenarios, is more used in uh, language for specific purposes, examinations and tests. And 
I think it's, it's the path we're heading to. Mediation is bringing us towards this integrated model of assessing. And it, it, it poses severe challenges. Uh, how to come up with a construct to include all the modes of communication in the exams. How to uh, have valid and reliable in, uh, instruments. Um, and how to go, how to deal with the existing language testing culture, which is more uh, unidimensional for, language, for general language competence. So it poses severe challenges, but I truly think that it's the way we, we need to go to. And just some final remarks. Um, I hope you can go home with. Uh, uh, to this point, uh, I think that it's pretty clear that mediation is not a skill. It's a mode of communication. And as such, is implied in tasks. So the focus is in the tasks uh, for which we, impl we, we employ different modes of communication. And mediation can be one of them. Uh, uh, and uh, because we need to conduct one or several communicative activities in order uh, for us to carry out those tasks. So a mode of communication is not a competence, but an integrated use of competencies. And these can be general, linguistic, cross-linguistic, plurilingual, intrapersonal, interpersonal, social, and intercultural, uh, among others. And then mediation is not professional translation, nor interpretation. It's a communicative activity uh, that can be cross-linguistic, and then it, it is close to translation and interpreting, but it's not professional in a way because uh, language users are not paid to translate or, or uh, interpret as such. They, they, they need to translate and interpret, uh, and interpret in, in daily life situation, situations. And these situations can be in the personal public uh, domains, but also in the academic and professional domains. Um, but not because they're translators or interpreters, because they need to carry out cross-linguistic mediation uh, tasks uh, that can be cross-linguistic, but not only, not always uh, cross-linguistic. And just to run off, uh, run up this presentation, uh, if we go back to our first uh, questions. I think that from all that I've uh, been talking about. Um, we could think that we need to restate these questions. Instead of what is mediation, we should be looking at which tasks imply mediation. Uh, for which tasks uh, our students need to become mediators. Uh, and then instead of how we mediate, what KSAs do these mediation tasks activate? Uh, and we need to train our students to be able to uh, to use. And then instead of how do we assess mediation in general, how can we assess this integration of key essays? Because the, we will have an integration of multiple uh, knowledge and skills and attitudes needed implied in uh, using uh, mediation. So with the final purpose goal in mind of making this match meeting heaven happen between teaching and learning, which is, of course, our main goal as teachers and learners uh, to come close to uh, the other side of the process. And I truly think that mediation with all this complexity and challenges uh, that it poses, it can help make this ma uh, match happen. And that's it. You have a list of all the references that I've used. And thank you very much for listening. And I will be happy to take uh, comments, questions uh, on the topic, uh, both in Spanish and in English. OK, thank you very much for this very good introduction to the concept of mediation, both in teaching activities and also in assessment. Uh, it is important for our students to have a purpose for their communication. And I think you gave many good examples of how to 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 use this in in, in situations of of, of really of, of um, everyday life, really situations. And and I also um, uh, work with interpretation and, and translation. And I think this was very good uh, examples of uh, because a lot of our students learning a foreign language they come up to these situations in the mm. real life. Uh, someone say, well, you know this language, so can you help me with this and that? So I think this is very good to, to bring into the class in this way uh, with, with this concept of mediation. 
So if there are any questions, we have a greeting from Munich. And thank you very much indeed, says uh, Paco, Paco Paya Puente from Munich. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so um, if there are any comments or questions, uh, please um, write them in the chat. So we have Maria Angeles Lamolda Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Adolfo, for bringing us the concept of mediation and helping us to be better mediators as language teachers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was a, it's a very, it's a it's a good connection with with the profession, the the professional side of mediation. Yes, it is. Yeah. And Sandra Guerrero says those were a bunch of new ideas to put into practice. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Teresa uh, Berce, Berceruelo, splendid presentation. Thank you so much. Okay. So good. here Thank is you. a lot of uh, nice words for you, but no question. Yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will just pose the question. Um, so I think, and we see that uh, there's a lot of teachers here saying that these are really good ideas to use in the in the language foreign language classroom. So um, are there any attitudes or um, teacher beliefs that uh, could in, could be an obstacle for for introducing this? How do you see that? Uh, uh, how are the are the teachers um, ready for this? Receptive for for this um, methodology? Uh, indeed, there are there are many beliefs and attitudes, and and uh, of course there is the cross linguistic issue because, as I said, in many settings, uh, cross linguistic practices in the language classroom have been forbidden. You you were not simply allowed to to use. Uh, uh, another language other than the, the, the language the students were learning. Uh, so that's a huge belief and, and that we will have to fight uh, mm -hmm. or deconstruct in a way uh, because mediation can be cross-linguistic, not only, but it can be cross-linguistic. So if we mm -hmm. um, have a task which implies mediation and this needs to be carried out cross-linguistically, we will have to face those fears and maybe try to convince people who are not including the students themselves because some students may, may also be re reluctant to use other languages in the in the foreign language classroom so the, there's the cross-linguistic belief mm -hmm. there's also the the, the belief that um, students need to learn items you know grammar and vocabulary and then mm -hmm. put all them together uh, in, in in order to carry out tasks, so it, it's not that you know an elite, uh, synthetic view of language. It's not you need. It's not that you need to learn these bricks and then put them all together in a wall. Is that you need to 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 build the wall, and by building the wall, you will learn how these bricks are and how they they combine, and and so there's task before. Uh, language, not language before task. And that's, I believe, too, uh, that we will have to be working on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there, and then there's a comment from Rosa Alonso Raya, so interesting and eye opening. And then we have a question from Fernando mm -hmm. Galan. How could this experience be used in the AUKUS Alliance? Is there any potential initiative that you see could be implemented in the near future? Uh, sure. Uh, the Arcus Alliance is, is based on cooperation among institutions. And this will be taking many times in a multilingual and multicultural uh, setting. So there will be uh, the need to use mediation in these encounters when uh, we prepare students to go abroad to, to, to be mobility students. When we have uh, meetings for, with people from different from the seven institutions where we will have to deal with cross-linguistic mediation, with uh, facilitating a pericultural space. We will need to take notes to pass that information on to our colleagues back uh, home because they haven't been able to attend. Uh, it's, it, it really, uh, it's really uh, linked to the multi, at least the multilingual vision mm -hmm. of the university that Arcus Alliance holds. So I think that it's a mode of communication among, together with production and reception and interaction, uh, very important for uh, this kind of uh, international interaction among, among colleagues, students, teachers, uh, staff, and, and so on. So yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. 
Then we have a comment from Carmen Ramos. Thank you very much for your insightful talk. Thank you. And then uh, Maria Teresa, I suppose it's Maria, Teresa uh, Becerruelo. In fact, both in class and outside, learners use their first language and mm -hmm. even others. Why not use them to enrich our students' competence to act in communication? Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. The plurilingual competence is one of the basic pillars of of the companion volume because um, we are not dealing with students. Back in the day, we had students who had an L1, maybe two L1s because they were from a bilingual region and then they were learning a foreign language and that was it. Now we have students who have one or two L1s and they learn a second language at home uh, because they travel a lot and then they learn a, second, a, a third language at the school uh, and then they have some interest in, in, in another language. And today we can access uh, languages uh, more uh, easily than before. So we have students with a more complex multi plurilingual, sorry, plurilingual profile nowadays. And we have to, to lean on that profile because the other languages that we know are there. I mean, they're not compartmentalized. They, they, all, they all interact. With each other, and, and when I learned German, I was use, I was using my English and my Latin, and when I learned learned French, of course I used my my Spanish, but I was using my English too, and I was transferring things from English into French, not from Spanish. So mm. they 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 all mix, and 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 we we have to take that in mind, yeah. And I think it is very important to to see all these languages that people know, even if they know just a little bit. Mm -hmm. to, to look at them as capital, as something very mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not an obstacle. Yes. Uh, yes. So that is that is very important. We have one mm -hmm. more comment from um, Angel Sureda. Really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Uh, thumbs up from uh, Teresa Becerruelo. Uh -huh. uh, are there any other questions or comments from the audience? No, not not at the moment. Uh -huh. So, do you think um, this the, the time we are living in now is a good time to introduce this mediation um, concept yes. in 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 the foreign language class and yes. any mm. it, it is because of the configuration of society nowadays. As I said, we have other language uses and. Mm. And we we use language diff in a, in different ways mm. um, we, from the ways we used it before, and also in these in COVID times, for example, let's take this very <laughs> current and, and and factual situation that we have mm. now in COVID times. But our mm. students at the university have had classes, online classes. They've mm. been interacting online, and mm. and sometimes they haven't been able to attend. They have had to watch recordings of the lessons and they've mm. need to ask other students for help for them to mm. explain things that were discussed in class but they couldn't attend and and so the, 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 there's a the need to mediate there too so uh, mediation is something it, it it's linked to the social dimension of language use mm. and uh, we use language uh, you know mm. in society uh, so it's linked to everyday language use. And mm. today, um, in today's society, because of, you know, people learning more languages mm. and, and also the, the, the permission that we have now to, to use other languages mm. and the potential that we now see, or at least we are allowed to see, because some, mm. some of us saw that potential before, but we were not allowed. So mm. that new teaching situation also gives floor to mm. new views on on mediation so i yes. truly think that it's making it's making the the student um center of the uh, learning experience uh, something we've been doing before but now with a more social view of the student uh, a more task-based approach to learning mm. uh, keeping tasks central all the times and, mm. and bearing in mind that um, communication is multifaceted, that has many mm. sides to it, mm. as mediation does. 
uh, and and you know bringing all this complexity together and, and looking for ways to 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 improve the the language the learning experience of our students mm. yeah we have a question from paco mm -hmm. payapuente do you think mediation can be useful in the starting levels a1 and a2 if so how could we implement it in a classroom with unexperienced learners yeah good question good question uh, the companion volume one of the things it's done is uh, uh, giving more descriptors for low levels, A1, A2. Uh, for the previous language activities that were in the CFR, but also for the new ones, including mediation. So we have descriptors there, there because it's, uh, it's not that mediation is useful for uh, learners of such level of or such profile or such setting. Um, the thing is that uh, we need to uh, ask ourselves what tasks will our, my students uh, need to carry out in real life, uh, regardless of their um, the level. Like they will need to carry out different tasks according to the level of the level, the level of competence. Uh, and do those tasks imply mediation at some point? And if so, we will need to use mediation because it's not that we're preparing students to mediate. We, 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 we are helping our students be able to carry out these tasks which imply mediation. And that's relevant for all levels because you need to, to carry out tasks, complex tasks at all levels. Depending on your level of competence, you, those tasks are more related to your you know, everyday life or with um, interaction with others or more professional or uh, the, the topics that those tasks uh, evolve, uh, revolve around are simple or simple or, or more difficult, but they, 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 they need all the, the modes of communication. So yes, yes, they, they can be. And all the strategies that we've been talking about, other languages that students know, that's a powerful tool for uh, beginners, for A1, A2 because we may have students who are starting to learn Spanish, for example, but they already know five languages. Mm -hmm. So how come I'm not gonna use that as a tool for them to learn Spanish? Because they're gonna do that uh, at the end of the day. So the best choice for me is to, you know, try to uh, help them use that tool in a more efficient way. So yes, mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is relevant for all levels. Uh, we just need to come up with the tasks which imply mediation as well as production and reception and interaction which are suitable, relevant for those uh, uh, students at A1 or A2. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I can't see any more uh, question, questions or comments at the moment. So. I would like to thank you for this very interesting talk and for your answer, answering the questions. And also to the audience, uh, Paco Paya, this is thank you. And I would thank like you. to thank the audience for, their, uh, for attending and also for their comments and questions. And also uh, the University of Granada, uh, Marina, who is behind the screen, making everything possible uh, to connect so we can connect from different uh, university different parts of europe and even outside europe sometimes uh, so inspiring says javier perez zapatero and uh, well uh, clm thank you very much adolfo and then uh, Ma uh, maria teresa berceruelo a1 and a2 learners are mediating all the time in class what did the teachers say Sorry, I didn't get that explanations, mm -hmm. reformulation, etc. happened also between learners. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. They're co-constructing meaning all the time. Even A1, A2 students, they, they, they go through all the stages of learning that the students go, uh, you know, uh, regardless the the level. Uh, so yeah, uh, that, that dimension of construction of meaning is a very good example of how A1, A2 students can can use mediation because they, they actually do. So yeah, good mm. comment, good remark, yes. Mm. 
Okay, so then I think we say thank you to everyone for today's lecture and remind you that there will be a new lecture in July. You will uh, can find information later at the Arcus Alliance website. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone. Thank you everyone for listening.